Hi, guys. So that's me. That's my email address. I put it up there because you can actually use it if you want to talk to me lately. What, later. What's my email address? Read it. Seriously, you can email me. I'm retired. I don't have that much to do. I always start with a warning. Are you ready? You know how they say that if you live with a pet long enough that you start to look like that pet that you love so much? Well, I don't look like a college student. I got wrinkles, gray hair, and jiggly arms, but I talk like one because college students have taught me most of what I know. And this is not just for advertisements. Would you like to see a picture of my son and his beloved golden doodle? You can't tell where one begins and the other ends. So here's the deal. I am a nurse practitioner. I like to say funny nurse practitioner. And I spent a lot of time working with college students. I'm still a scientist of, and seeker of truth. I do not easily believe what I am told, and I count a lot of things. So I hope you brought your cell phone, and we're going to do some anonymous polling in the middle. Um, I am also what's called a recovery ally, and I noticed many of you signed the um, banner out there as a recovery ally. As a recovery ally, I am not a person in long-term recovery but I am a person who gets to work every day to beat the stigma that is leveraged against addiction. And as I heard another recovery ally say, being in recovery is simply one of the most kick-ass things any human being can do. And I get to hang out with really cool people in recovery. I would like to thank your family for uh, supporting this cause 100% of my fee will go to the JHW Foundation, which sponsors young adult recovery. And they were essential in starting Rams in Recovery at VCU, which now has 100 students on campus in recovery, and there are 12 colleges across our state. I would love to see one. I know it kind of comes and goes at Villanova, but if you know someone or a faculty member, you too deserve a co collegiate recovery program. Now, I should never admit this, but I have a very unusual fantasy life because when I say that, I lose half the people's attention in the audience. Would you like to know my current fantasy? You're like, I don't know, old white woman, kind of creepy. But anyway, here's my current fantasy. Um, I would like to change the way we do health education. I think it should all just be about awareness and curiosity. I don't even call drugs drugs anymore. I call them molecules because we're too judgmental. And I've switched to calling them habit loops. And, you know, I've spent my whole life watching things, and I do not give young people advice. Are you ready? I will give you only one piece of advice, college students. Are you ready? If you have not had your babies yet, have more than one. That way you won't take so much of the credit or so much of the blame, okay? Do you have brothers and sisters? I have three sons raised in the exact same experimental environment. They're all totally different. Are you different than your brothers and sisters? Yes. I should have quit while I was ahead. My youngest son is a wild man. He came out of the womb arguing. When he was three, he was in the street. I'm like, Dave, there's a car coming. He looked around. He said, it's a truck. <laughs> when he's seven, he wears one orange sock, one purple sock to soccer practice. There has never been a dare Dave would not take. When he was 13 to raise money for Christmas, he went to the neighbor's house dressed in nothing but his boxer shorts and a Canadian flag. Now, wouldn't you like to be friends with Dave? He's a fun guy. And I was talking to a group of coaches one time, and I said, so what do you think? Will Dave do drugs when he goes to college? And a guy in the back row yelled, no, in high school. And I was like, Damn, he's probably right. So that's when I came up with the question, what's the most devastating drug? But then I switched it to molecule. And today's talk, really, it is all about habit loops. The trouble is you can't actually answer that question based on what we've bothered to teach you so far in America. So let's just start with this first. How stressed are you? Fingers one to five. One, not stressed. Five, very stressed. And if you're really, really stressed, yeah, do the sparkle hands thing. I see some sparkle hands over there. All right. So in the name of well-being, have you ever had a friend who's having a panic attack like right in front of your eyes? Let's just quickly do something called the three things exercise. So everybody, if you don't mind, you've had a tough day, it's a tough Monday, everybody sit up straight in your chair, feet on the floor, 
Relax your shoulders down your back. And for this exercise, we're going to come to the present moment and you keep your eyes open. So just begin to breathe. And I want you to notice three things in the environment. Just look at an object. Notice the color. Notice the texture. Notice the outline. And as you continue to breathe, I want you to hear three things in this environment right now. Movement outside, hum of the air conditioner, the sound of my voice. And as you continue to breathe and be here, I want you to feel three things. Your shoulders relaxing down your back, the weight of your body in the chair, and your breath sliding gently in and out. And now that you've, re you've arrived here, if you would just take a look at me, it only takes a breath to change things. And I know middle schoolers who've been taught to text each other dot B, which is stop, breathe. So if you have friends who are really stressed, just text them so they know that you care about them and it brings them back to the present moment. All right, so that's my challenge to talk about what it means to live and, and lead in well-being. I want you to think, close your eyes and think of a leader you really respect, like maybe the father that we're honoring with this talk. Think of someone you really, really admired. Then think of a word that would describe that leader. Now open your eyes, introduce yourself to the person next to them, and tell them what that word was that described that leader. Go ahead, tell that person next to you what describes that leader. All right. Can I have a few brave people raise their hand and give me some words? What words have I got? Way in the back, yell it out. Passionate. What else have I got? Somebody cares. What other words? Yeah. What? Caring. Did anybody, anybody over here say caring? Look at the front row nodding their heads. Everybody said caring. Was a lot of that, was that a lot of you come up with compassionate or caring? Was that one of the reasons they were sincere about it? So, in order to be that compassionate leader that so many of us uh, admire, I'll tell you the story of the habit horse. There was this guy, and he like rode across campus every day, looking very official, going places, back and forth, back and forth. One day, somebody yelled and said, hey, where are you going? And the guy said, I don't know, ask the horse. And the point is, did you know 80% of our lives we live unconscious of what we're doing? Rarely are we present in our own lives. And so to really be a leader, to really be compassionate in your community, you have to know what you're doing in the present moment. So I'm a nurse and a scientist, and I know that habits are not bad, they just are that they helped us survive, and that this is our operating system right there, and we need to understand it. Everything you do. How many athletes? Where are my freshman athletes? They're athletes. Aren't habits your friend? Aren't you taught to throw a certain way, dribble a certain way, run a certain way so that it becomes unconscious and you just do it in the moment? Habits are good, and they help us do a lot of things, and they save us time. And and habits have been going on everything, all the way up from the sea slug to all other animals. And they now, because we're human, we can think, plan, and create. We can also get ourselves into trouble with that. So I do have bribes. I have lifesavers for people who will talk to me. Um, so if I was to ask you, and you have to think outside the box, what is the most common addictive habit loop on this campus? Who wants to guess? Raise your hand. Who wants the lifesavers? Come on. Where we go? Over here. What do you got? Oh, man. She nailed it right there, looking at our phones. Here we go. I actually can hurt people that way. Give her a big round of applause. Did you know 
They actually hire psychologists to make it addictive. You get a little hit of dopamine every time you take a look at that phone. And they know that neurons that fire together wire together. So I need to do just a little bit of education. This is a picture of Bonnie. Bonnie was the first president of Rams in Recovery. Bonnie started using molecules at 13, was addicted by 16, and in recovery by 19. And Bonnie was a criminal justice major. And her professor that day was talking about how criminal justice issues overlap with substance use issues. And the professor was using terms like junkie, pothead. And Bonnie, instead of getting angry, just wrote those derogatory terms down, made tally marks, and at the end of class went up to her professor and said, hey, I really enjoyed your class until today. But you should know that I'm a person in long-term recovery. And every time you use one of those hurtful words, it endangers my sobriety and it prevents other people from coming forward. And the professor was like, you are so right, light bulb moment. Will you co-present with me at the next class? So if you know this terminology, people first, it is people with substance use disorders, people with opiate use disorders, alcohol use disorders, Nicotine use disorders, I love people who smoke and vape. I think they're interesting people. Like, it's just my job to keep them on the planet longer. They're interesting people. Yes, cannabis use disorder. Abuse is a negative term. We try not to use it and instead use use and disorder. Addiction is still the most severe form. And we try really hard not to refer to someone as clean and dirty because people are not clean and dirty. People either test positive or negative. And this is the most boring slide in my slide set, but everything in life is on a continuum. So 60 to 70% of people either won't use alcohol or won't use in ways that hurt themselves or others. 10 to 20% will use in ways that can hurt themselves or others. And 5 to 10% will go on to have the disorder. And that too is on a continuum, mild, moderate, and severe. So why do I bother to share this with you? Because it's how you treat the people that have issues. Treat them with kindness and compassion in a community that respects them, and they can rethink what they're doing and maybe move back. But if you treat them with judgment and isolation, isolate them, they're more likely to develop the disease. All right, college students aren't stupid, right? Right? You might do stupid things, but you're not stupid, right? So turn to the person next to you. I bet you're pretty smart. People get stuck in habit loops. I want you to come up with at least five reasons why people might choose to use a molecule. Go ahead, five reasons now. Okay. I have done all the research, and I will bet I'm going to name these off, and you tell me if you got a couple of them. You ready? Did anybody say to fit in peer pressure? And let me ask you, do you think it's friends like use, telling you use, 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 or do you think you walk into a room and you sort of wonder what everybody else is doing, like the invisible people in your head? Yeah. How many people said curiosity? Like, what does that mango-flavored vape taste like? Did anybody say to feel good? It's been a really hard week and I need to feel better. How about to feel better? I'm anxious, I'm depressed. You know, my mom was just diagnosed with cancer. I just can't deal. Or to perform better. Like those are all different reasons. So I am gonna kind of talk about this one. This is not an alcohol drug talk. I know it feels like it right now, um, but these things are all kind of, so stress is a big one. And there's a big difference between why people might start to use, maybe I'm curious, um, or because my friend is using, but then why they continue. So when I was a young nurse, I worked in a neurointensive care unit, and I would see young people who got liquored up drive into walls and broke their brains. And this is when I fell in love with the molecule nicotine. It's a fascinating molecule. So this one guy is unconscious on my respirator, fighting my respirator, and his girlfriend taps me on the shoulder and says, he's a two-pack-a-day smoker. I'll bet if he stuck him on a nicotine patch, he'd calm down. Unconscious, I stick him on a nicotine patch, calms right down. Nicotine is a 
fascinating habit loop molecule that is difficult to stop even in a coma. And this is where I learned that all human beings are charming genetic snowflakes. No two people are the same. Did you know out of four people who tries nicotine, one in four is missing a gene that makes an enzyme in their liver to break it down? They try to vape or chew or dip, they're gonna turn green and puke. They got no enzymes. And the same thing is true for alcohol. You know how you go to a party and like there's always that genetic snowflake at the party who has like one beer and they're like, oh my God, I'm like so drunk. And you're like, seriously, like you had a half a beer. And then there's the other guy at the party who like the first time he drinks can put away eight, 10 or 12 and you're like, and if he feels nothing and everybody else is having a good time, what's he gonna do? Drink more, probably gonna get social acclaim, probably not have a hangover because people are different genetic snowflakes. I definitely have a lifesaver pack for this one. I've been working with um, people that are so severely addicted that they are homeless now. So I work at a place called The Healing Place, that's where I volunteer. If you were to predict what, what they teach you in high school was the gateway drug. Didn't they tell you weed, cannabis, right? Although I was at a high school and they're like, marijuana, what's that? I'm like, well, what do you guys call it? And they're like, Zaza. <laughs> like, okay, Zaza. Um, so they taught you it was weed. What do you think the real gateway to severe addiction is? Come on, lifesaver, who wants to take a guess? Alcohol can be a gateway drug. That's, it's, you gotta think outside the box for this one. What do you got way in the back? <laughs> what did he say? Society. Society? No, that's outside the box, so I'll give you that. What'd you say? Sugar is definitely outside the box, not where I'm going. All right. Who's my red bandana people? I mean, my green bandana people. All right. Actually, the real gateway to severe addiction is trauma. I mean, if you have had some type of trauma, doesn't matter what it is, and you find a molecule or a habit that soothes you. Do you see how hard that is to break that habit loop? So that's the real gateway drug. So as leaders, both for yourself and for the people that you will serve and lead, you have to understand you cannot cheat biology. And knowing how your operating system works will be the biggest difference in your lives and their lives. So I was talking to a group of NCAA athletes. I do the NCAA athlete conference all the time. And I was teaching them about anxiety. And the conference planner's daughter was like, oh, she's like seven. She's like, I know about anxiety and mindfulness. We're studying it in class. And I'm like, okay, girl, come on up here. She's like seven. She says to me, well, this is my brain. It kind of looks like a brain, doesn't it? She's like, this is my brain. This is my amygdala, my warning, warning, danger part of my brain. This is my emotions. She says, when I get anxious or angry, I flip my lid. Have you guys heard this? Yeah. It is so true. And when you have flipped your lid, can you use your prefrontal cortex? Nope, it's offline. And she proceeded, here I'll teach you what she taught me. Put your hands out in front, turn them upside down, cross them, link your fingers, bring it in, give yourself a big hug. That was one of her skills. She's seven and she knows her brain can flip its lid. So here's what I'd say. Your brain is like a three layer cake with only one way in and one way out. You cannot talk cortex to cortex to somebody who's upset. Have you ever had a friend who's like having a major meltdown? Are they irrational? So, so talking to them is a waste of time. So as a leader, what you need to know is if the people that you're working with have flipped their lids, you need to, they teach police officers and firemen to get down on the level of the kids so they're not so intimidating. If you have a friend who's upset, don't talk to them. Their cortex is offline. You could take them for a walk outside. You could rock in chairs. You could breathe. You could color. But until they have their amygdala, they're calmed down, that, and then just notice the feelings, because if you can name the feeling, you can tame it, and finally, they will be able to talk to you. All right, do you have research crushes? 
Everybody in college should have research crushes. This is my current research crush. This guy's amazing. Addiction psychiatrist, researcher, 25 years of mindfulness practice. His name is Dr. Judd. He says we all struggle with something. Anxiety, emotional eating, smoking, shopping, anger, you name it, we all got issues. And change is possible. And for those of you who are like, I don't know why this lady is droning on about molecules. I don't use them. I'm never going to use them. It's not an issue for me. But we all got issues. Maybe it's we want to eat better. He, it's, he really has a great book on anxiety. And what Dr. Judd says is habits helped us survive, right? You run from a tiger, you live, you eat, you're starving, you survive. But our prefrontal cortex is pretty smart and we're not attacked by many tigers and we most of us have enough food. So 11 o'clock at night, you're not hungry at all. You're studying for that big final tomorrow and your prefrontal cortex goes, huh, not hungry, but I bet if I had a Sunday, I'd feel better, right? and a habit loop is born. Or maybe you have to go for a job interview and you're really stressed and you're like, you know, when I had that like mango flavored vape, felt a little less anxious, maybe I'll try some. Or you're like, I'm really stressed, I need to take my mind off of it, let's do that gambling thing, that was fun for a while. Or maybe you stumbled onto a porn site and all of a sudden you're like, I feel better now. Now there's another habit loop that can start. So here's the deal. We have an old brain that is faced with super potent novel engineered products that get us looped into everything, including screens, click and buy, you name it. So here's the bottom line. Once you flipped your lid, willpower doesn't work. So if you want to change any behavior, Dr. Judd says the three most powerful words are, oh, by the way, I want to ask you something. Do you have friends who sometimes do dumbass stuff? You know what I'm talking about? I don't know. <laughs> Somebody's like, I could name names, yeah. Um, do you sometimes do stuff that's like not so bright? So the three most powerful words, please read them with me, ready, are Hmm, that's interesting. I just did 95 and a 35. What was I thinking, right? Where you do something, and if you beat yourself up, is that going to make you feel any better or more effective? No. It's only when we take a step back, and here's how you step out of habit loops. People do stuff just trying to survive. It's hard to get through life. Don't judge the people you work with or the students that you know. Life is hard. But if you can be aware of what's triggering your behavior and then get really curious about what's going on, now you got something going. So I think as a leader you should understand people get isolated and beat themselves up because they think they're the only ones. And they think, you know, habit loops. I'm what's called a social norms researcher, so I love to look at what people think is real and what's really real. So I'm going to ask you guys really quickly. Well, by the way, you do know this pencil is not broken, right? That's an optical illusion. But did you know there's social optical illusions as well? Like you get stuck in ruts. So let us, let me prove it to you. Let's spell this word out loud three times fast. Here we go. You ready? T -O -P -S. T -O -P -S. T -O -P -S. What do you do when you get to a green light? I go when I get to a green light, but many of you said stop because I put you in a little mental rut. Okay. What color is my paper? What color is this paper bag? What color is this paper towel? What do cows drink? Cows drink water, cows don't drink milk, but I put you in a little mental rut, so you kept on going. So if the only thing we teach you about molecule habit loops is don't drink, don't drink, don't drink, we've in essence put you in a little mental rut, and you might think everyone drinks, but like, do they? Then it gets worse, our culture says, don't have sex, don't have sex, don't have sex. And then we're pretty sure everyone's getting it but us, right? 
Like, so what would you say to doing a little experiment? This is only for the college students, sorry faculty member that are here. Will you look around the room, would you like to know the truth about other people's issues? But it only works if we tell the truth. So grab your cell phone, get it ready. I'm asking you, all right. All right. So I can hide your results too. All right. So you can either take a cell phone picture of this, take your cell phone, hit on the QR code, or you can just go to menti.com and type in those digits. And when you get there, if you could give me like the thumbs up, then I'll know that you're in. So go ahead. If you need to move around, get up to get in there to get in. I want to get as many people as possible in on the polling. And this is for, well, faculty, you can do the first couple ones, um, but then it's students only. All right? So everybody can get in. Everybody good? And the instructions will be on every slide. So I got 160, almost 170 of you in. So I'm going to go ahead, but you can keep joining, all right? All right. And don't forget to hit submit at the end because it will show up on your cell phone so that you can do that. All right. So what habit loop issue are you most interested in? Nicotine, cannabis, alcohol, anxiety, overeating. Oh, and I'll prove to you I can... I can hide it and then show it up again. Gambling, porn, other. Go, go, go. I like to prove to you I can just show it and then pop back up. So, anxiety, no, no big shocker. This is Villanova. It's kind of high pressure to get in here. Screen use is number two. But there's a whole bunch of different issues. Do you notice how it's on a continuum and that not everybody has the most important habit loop that they're interested in? All right. I'm just curious why you came tonight, if you don't mind telling me. Was it the food or the giveaways? Did you come with a friend? Was it for ACS or Thrive C60 to improve what you know about personal well-being, developing leadership skills, or other? Ooh, 20% are saying other. What's the other? What? <laughs> Athletics. Is that the one I missed? Yeah, that's you guys. Yeah, thank you guys for being here. I appreciate it. Okay, I was just curious why you guys came. All right, so here are our perception reality questions. These are only for students, and I am going to hide them until most, of, like I get 160 of you in. So look around the room. Give me your best perception guess. How many days do most students in this room drink energy drinks? Go ahead. Zero days all the way up to every day. Go ahead. Click it in. I got 80 of you in. I know you don't know the answer. Just give me your best guess. We're talking Red Bulls monsters. We're not talking coffee. What is your... All right, I got 180 of you in, so I'll show you. So you guys think most people are using energy drinks three to four days per week, and only 14% said zero. All right, so be honest. How many days per week do you use energy drinks? Click it in. I'll stop when we get up to at least 160 no judgment here. It's fine. You can use energy drinks. All right. You guys were guessing 14% zero. And in reality, it's like 69% zero. In most groups that I go to, seniors through freshmen, 60 to 70% of people don't use energy drinks. Why don't you? Most of you don't use them. Why don't you use them? Cost five bucks. Taste bad. You like coffee better? Whatever, right? Okay, no judgment. It's just people are different. But you guys thought most people drank them. Why do you think that is? Because they're advertised to you. You see the colorful cans. So there is a big difference between perception and reality. All right, look around the room. I don't go to Villanova. I want you to guess how many days per month. I'm going to hide the results. <laughs> how many days per month do you think most students vape nicotine? Go ahead. I know you don't know the number, but just give me your best perception guess. Go, go, go. And you guys are guessing. Got over 160 of you in, and you guys said you think every day. Okay, really? And only 6% said zero? Okay. So that's your perception. It's easy to see people that vape because they hold something. So now be honest, and I'm going to hide it. How many days per month do you vape nicotine? And I already told you I love 
people who smoke and vape. I think they're interesting. I just want to keep them on the planet longer. Okay. And in reality, it's like 76% of you, 78%. And those of you who are in that habit loop that you do it daily, and those of you who are on the way, just realize most people don't vape but it gets linked to the environment in that habit loop. And if you are a genetic snowflake, it can be hard to quit. And that's why it doesn't hurt to ask somebody. All right, I don't go to Villanova, so you guys tell me, how many days per month do most students drink alcohol? Zero to five days, all the way up to every day. Give me your best perception guess. And you guys said, you think most people are drinking six to 10 days. What'd you do, add up Thursday, Friday, Saturday, gave them a day off for good behavior. Some of you are saying every day. Only 9% said zero to five. All right, be honest, no judgment. How many days per month do you drink alcohol? And nobody knows who's putting in which answers. This is totally anonymous. And you guys said, the majority of you, it is zero to five days. And some of you, it's every day. So you know what really frosts my Fruit Loops? <laughs> you know those stupid sitcoms like Desperate Housewives and those movies where every night people go home and have a glass of wine, every night people have a beer? If you want to get an, a habit loop entrenched in your body, doing the same thing all the time connected to that behavior makes it very difficult to stop. So there's no judgment but I wish we would talk to people in ways that they could get what they want, not what they don't want. So um, I think you guys only have medical marijuana here in uh, Rhode, Rhode Island, correct? Is it medical? All right, anyway, just curious. How many days per month do most students use cannabis, pot, or Zaza, as they say down in the high schools in Richmond? Not devil's lettuce, but Zaza, okay. Um, and you guys said, you guys said, you think, eh, one to five days, and only 12% said zero. All right, be honest, how many days per month do you use cannabis? And you guys said, in reality, most of you don't, and some people it's every day. So the thing to do is look at what you want. When I used to see students who used uh, cannabis on a regular basis every day, most of them were trying to treat anxiety. That was the reason that they were using. And unfortunately, it will work, and then it'll kind of yo-yo on you is the thing that I see. So it's that like thinking through um, the connections and habit loops. Okay, if the person next to you has fallen asleep, go ahead and wake them up, because we're going to talk about sex now, all right? So I did notice as you were coming in that you're a very good-looking group of people, all right? So I want to ask your perception. How many sex partners do you think most people in this room get per year? I'm talking like 12 months, not just since January, like an entire 12 months. Give me your best guess. All right. And you guys go, the people are still counting their fingers and toes. Come on, guys, click it in here. Make a, just take your best guess. All right, and you guys said, you think most people, two to three partners, there's always somebody who thinks everybody's getting it but them. Always, always, always. And only 11% said zero to one? Okay, all right. Be honest, I know you know this number. How many sex partners have you had in the last 12 months? Totally anonymous, you don't have to answer. Just tell the truth if you wanna tell the truth. I mean, if you wanna engage. And you guys were not guessing very many zero to one. And in reality, it's like 69%. That was okay, almost all, all right, there we go. And some people are getting a lot of sex. So here's the deal. If I brought, what I, I have done this polling with a million students, and in every group I have ever talked to, zero to one is always the most normative response. What do people really want in their lives? Relationships, not worry about diseases. And by the way, who's getting more sex? The person with one sex partner per year, or the person with five? 
They're getting it on a regular basis and they're getting better quality because they're practicing, okay? Like people are people. <laughs> but here's the point. You guys, on every single one of those things that we did, um, you guys were healthier than you thought and yet people also have habit loop issues. Some people do. So the point is not to judge people but to realize that things that stick out, we overestimate. Things that are hard to see, we underestimate. Did you know that most college students pray or meditate daily or weekly? But you wouldn't guess that high because prayer is invisible, right? You could be sitting there right now thinking, this lady is so boring, I think I'll talk to God instead, like no one would know. You have to count. And so... Make your decisions on your health behavior based on the health in your heart, because most people are actually pretty healthy. And the bottom line is, I hope you realize, we all have issues, they're just different issues. And if we want to be a community of caring, we need to know we've got our own thing, other people got their things, and we become stronger when we come together. So can you handle a little bit more science? I'm so sorry. I will give the, the lifesavers to anybody who dares to answer this. It's really stupid. What is that? No. Who said, who said, what'd you say? There you go. It's a, watch it. I'm going to kill somebody. Here we go. There we go. Yes, it's a brainwave. Very good. All right. So I thought maybe it would make you... This is what Dr. Judd taught me the most. There is a point in the brain called the default mode network. It's several places in the brain. And it is activated and inflamed when we are anxious or craving or, you know how something bad happens in class and you're like, no, that professor, blah, blah, blah. And next time I'm going to say this about that, right? You know how you do that? Does that make things any better? No, it just inflames your default mode network. What calms it down is coming back and being engaged in the moment. There's also a good place in our prefrontal cortex that looks for the bigger, better offer, that is curious about what we really want. So here is Dr. Judd, two minutes, and Anderson Cooper. So habits aren't bad or good, they just are. Um, and it's so easy to change when we want to, but not when we have to. So have you guys heard this definition of mindfulness? Paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment. Can we read that last word together? We spend so much time judging ourselves and others. As leaders, we have to let that go. And I think everything in life is like shoes. You know, I try on shoes and some fit and some don't, but you don't give up wearing shoes. That's the way it is. Teachers are like shoes. Counselors are like shoes. Everything's like shoes. You try it on, you see if it fits. Majors are like shoes. One of the shoes that fits me is when I was at VCU, a student painted this for me. Like, my boss was always upset with me because I was pushing the envelope and my head would be swirling around. So the minute I leave a door space, I try to be like the dog and just notice what's going on. Because really, who's happier, the dog or the guy? Who do people like better? I'm just saying, okay? So if you were to look at mindfulness, there's unfocused awareness practices like stepping outside and notice what's going on, mountain biking, art, music. But there are also things called focused awareness practice, and these are things like seated meditation or centering prayer. These are tougher. People don't usually do these unless their life is a mess. If your life is really stressful, I knew this, second year, this first year medical student who meditated every day. He had been in a car accident that he caused. He owed somebody $2 million. He was a little stressed, but mindfulness changed his life, and he made a way better doctor. So if you've ever tried to meditate, we had a Buddhism professor who used to t send students out. Have you guys ever tried to meditate, like in silence, and just focus on your breath? So that's what the Buddhism professor, she sent them out to meditate for 30 minutes, and then they had to write a paper. And this one kid was like, Oh, so relaxing. It was the best time. She gave him a big fat F. 
right? Because what, what was the truth? Had he tried that? No, because is your mind calm when you sit down to meditate? No, it's called monkey mind. You sit down to focus on your breath. I have to use a word. That's, I do centering prayer. Um, your mind will immediately go, my nose itches. Oh, my God, did you see that funny cat video? That professor so ticked me off. I've got this due, and i got to get that, right? That's normal. It's noticing that your mind watered and returning to your breath. It's noticing and returning, not judging. Noticing and not judging. If you went to the gym and did one curl, would that change your body? Same thing with the mind. You can't just do it once. It has to be done. It's called the daisy pattern. And so it's not emptying the mind. It's realizing that you are not your thoughts. You are the awareness that can step back and notice your thoughts. Okay, how many of you are gonna be leaders or bosses one day? Got them up, you guys, you guys are smart. You're all gonna be leaders and bosses. What is the number one reason people leave their jobs? Their boss is a major jerk. That is the number one reason. Their boss is on a habit horse and is unaware that they have issues or that their team has issues and they are not acting with compassion. So I'll just tell you this story in my life. So when baby Dave was 15, I offered him 50 bucks for Christmas if he could answer the question, what's the most devastating drug? And he immediately came back, mom, nicotine, legal product, kills so many people. I'm like, good thinking, Dave, not what I'm thinking. Next day, mom, alcohol, legal product, DUIs, kills people. Good thinking, Dave, not what I'm thinking. Then he went to heroin and crystal meth, Finally, after two weeks, Dave comes back. Mom, I got it. It's not a drug, it's an idea. He said, that's right, Dave. The answer to the question, what's the most devastating drug, is, of course, the one you like the best. It is really, truly the habit loop that meets the need in your life. It's also the one that is in your environment. So if a gambling app is easily accessible to you or other things, could be that. And if you have a history of trauma and you're trying to deal with something and it helps, that can be hard to change. And so it really ultimately is the habit loop with no awareness and too much judgment. So these are a picture of my three sons. The one in the middle is baby Dave, my big goofy son. Baby Dave stands 6'4". 200 pounds of muscle. Baby Dave was never going to go to college. He was going to be a Navy SEAL. And two weeks after this picture was taken, he was diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic, which means he has to shoot up insulin every day of his life, and he could not be in the military. He got angry and depressed, started punching out doors, burning holes in his arms. He's in counseling. We're in counseling. I had him all packed up to go on a therapy trip. What does a pissed off 17 year old do? Ran away. Your friends will take you in for the night, but they won't raise you. Hardest thing I ever did, my husband and I, we packed all of his clothes and his insulin. When he came home the next day, we told him he couldn't live at home anymore. He cried, signed a contract, said he'd be better. And two weeks later, he shoplifted a 12 pack at a Wawa and was picked up in like 30 seconds because that's how he was dealing with his pain was that habit loop, right? He did go on the trip. He went a bundle of rage and came back my son because he had a dream, decided he wanted to go to college, did pretty good freshman year, A's and B's. But then what does a social outgoing guy join? Fraternity. Fraternity. My son has since had several near-death experiences, but the last time he almost died, his friends had the courage to sit his ass down and say, Dave, we love you, man, but you cannot be like that and be a part of us. And Dave cared enough about his friends that he was one of those nine in 10 who still had the chance to move backwards. He did not move on to addiction. Dave has grown up. You wanna see, he's still a little wild. Would you like to see the suit he wore to the Christmas party? Right there, gangsta claws, right there. But I'll tell you what, his caring community, the courage of his friends, 
saved his life and mine. Oh, by the way, you should congratulate me. Baby Dave is going to have a baby in July. I'm going to be a grandma. And I owe it all to his friends. I will end with just these comments. When baby Dave was 16 and I was sure he was going to be dead or in jail, I was on my knees and had to learn to meditate daily. And I have meditated and sat in stillness 20 minutes every day for the last 18 years. And it has changed my life. I'm a leader, right? Worked really hard. Came home at the end of the day. I was tired. I was hangry. And by the way, you are leaders in your family and with your friends as well. Came home. I was hangry. Get into the kitchen. My husband, who never cooks, had cooked chili, but there was a third of an onion and a third of a can of tomato soup on it next to the counter, and I picked up the onion, and I was ready to hurl it at the trash can, and my brain was like, that's weird. Most people don't throw onions at trash cans. Arm midair, I'm like, huh. What did I say? Hmm. That's interesting. Wonder why I'm doing that. Turns out, in my family, we had five kids, and my dad was a bartender. We didn't have a lot of money. That onion, that tomato soup should have been in the chili. My husband, his father was an angry perfectionist who drank too much. And if you didn't do the right thing, you were punished. So if the recipe called for two-thirds of an onion, that's all that was going to go in. I put it down, walked into the living room, kissed my husband, had a bowl of chili, and had a good night. And so that's why, as a leader, it's really important that we be aware of our own issues and habit loops. So I hope from this talk that the three most powerful words show up in your life for the rest of your life. Don't beat yourself up. Just get more curious about what you're getting and what you want. And I would like to talk just for a second about collegiate recovery. Do you guys know what an ADGO is? Have you ever heard that? Stands for another darn growth opportunity. So we used to think success looked like this, but my students in recovery have such great wisdom because they've had to deal with really challenging habit loops. So if you think you got issues that can't be solved, that's like not true. Of course they can be solved. Um, I am going to ask if you don't mind because I'm seriously trying to figure out whether I should just shut up and go watch birds or keep talking. Like I'm like, really, Linda, you got issues. You should just go bird watch. But anyway. Um, so be honest, uh, it's like texting. If you're still in, go ahead and just give me a couple comments about what you thought about tonight. We do have a couple minutes for questions, and then I think there's some other people coming up after me just for a couple minutes. And you're going to get t-shirts, and you're going to get stress balls. So type in those things. Uh, the responses are hidden. Hit submit when you're done so it flies. And does anybody have questions while people are typing comments? Because I am happy to answer any questions, and I'd love to hear comments. Was this a waste of your time or helpful? Was it helpful? Thank you. Appreciate that. Oh, and by the way, I have baby Dave's permission to tell this story, because I know they're videoing it back there. Yeah, he loves me. He, put up, he puts up with me pretty well. Oh, and guess what? He's decided after all these years of being Irish that he's a Viking instead. His DNA says those Vikings must have. So the baby's name is going to be Odin. Yes, baby Odin James. All right. Questions, comments? Thank you for submitting them. I know some of you probably got class. I am going to stick around for a while afterwards. Any questions? I... Was it worth doing the perception reality thing? Was that helpful at all? You guys are really pretty healthy. And actually, for your orientation people that are here, all incoming freshmen should know that they're healthier than they think and that this, the world, and you can do that. Mentimeter is so cheap and free. You could do this. I could teach you how to do that. Okay. All right. What's up next? 
Thank you for your comments. I'll just let it run. Thank you very much.